In the light of what has preceded me, my address is more likely than not to be unlike any other you will hear during the course of this conference. Having had a career on the bench, I'm used to speaking first or speaking last or both. And already this morning, the Attorney General and Dr. Doak have preempted me on a few subjects. I make no apology for repetition of topics because it provides for variation in themes. I will have to apologise in advance if I'm seen to be fussing with my papers to accommodate a response or two to what has hitherto fallen from my preceding speakers. I am grateful, nonetheless, for the opportunity to participate in this conference today. Given the credentials of the other keynote speakers and other name participants, I must say, however, that I'm surprised to be here. As a private citizen, my contact with victimhood has hitherto been virtually nil. In my professional careers, 18 years as a trial judge and five years as a sentence administrator, uh, my experience with victimhood, let alone its study, has been both contained and constrained. My experience generally in perspectives, perspectives will be from an entirely different standpoint, I imagine, to those uh, enjoyed by every other speaker. <coughs> the last mentioned proposition will form the substance of my remarks in due course. What I propose to do is first, based on private, quite private, and subjective responses, construct two bookends, each extreme in its nature and content, but moving from the banal to the catastrophic, between which will be, secondly, the statement of some propositions and principles in the correctness of which my conviction is unshakable. Then thirdly, come to the substance of my professional connection with victimhood in the courtroom and in the corrections regime. First bookend. I have the mixed fortune of living in that part of Sydney not far from here, known as Paddington. When I venture forth on my neighbourhood's footpaths, I am conscious immediately of an in heightened awareness of big black four-wheel drives being driven by a person using a handheld mobile phone, either reverse parking into a space dangerously close to me on the footpath or about to collide with another person with a leashed dog in one hand, a mobile between ear and shoulder, pushing a pram of immense proportions, <laughs> jaywalking 20 metres from a pedestrian crossing with no ostensible purpose, I suppose, than to get to the other side. I am convinced by observations of such frequent daily occurrences that there must be more lawbreakers and incipient killers at liberty in this state than the 10,000 or so presently in custody. <laughs> the next component of the first bookend is founded upon the often unsafe assumption that press reports are accurate. 
I wish to refer, perhaps not surprisingly, to the recent event that closed the Sydney Harbour Bridge for two hours because of what is reported to have been the actions of one man with a domestic grievance and with military experience. When that happened, or when I read about its happening, I naturally embarked upon conjecture. Why close the bridge for two hours at all? Risk of terrorism appeared to be the immediate response. Who had a stroke? A coronary incident, a miscarriage, failed to get a job, or was late for work because of this event. The limits to victimhood, I mused, could not be calculated. I was candidly dismayed that the alleged offender who was granted bail has become a celebrity and no doubt in the former instance was dealt with lawfully by his or her honour, the learned magistrate in the local court. The next component of the first bookend is perhaps the doorway to the second bookend. It is not banal in the least, even if one subscribes to Hannah Arendt's dictum about evil. I was at a social function in a friend's home and at one end of the couch was my wife who was born in Hungary. Next to her was a lady of some elegance who appeared to be in her mid-seventies and she and my wife were conducting a conversation in Hungarian as I nibbled at my sandwich. The lady turned to me and said, I do apologise for talking to your wife in Hungarian. I was born in Bratislava and used to speak Hungarian often until I was told it was forbidden. That was when they made me a bookkeeper in Auschwitz. That was a conversation stopper, if ever I had heard one. Well, I have read that lady's book, My Two Lives, in which she writes of the collapse and death by her side of her two sisters during a freezing winter roll call and the fact that to this day that which is most precious to her is a piece of fresh bread. This connection with a survivor naturally takes me to this new era over the passing decades, straddling two centuries of new holocausts, ethnic cleansing revolutions and counter-revolutions, liberation movements or mere wars. Today the victim can range from a child to a city to a nation. This endless wave of violence, internationalised, politicised, but often not publicised, has had one of many awful consequences. The victims of this new wave of human violence enjoy less compassion than those victims of nature's violence by tsunami, flood, fire or earthquake. The reason for that, in my view, is that the human species and condition is flawed. The recognition that this is, has ever been and will ever be so, compels that we keep trying. For example, there was established by the United Nations 
and I think I believe I give it its full title, Dr. Doe could correct me, the International Tribunal for the Prosecution of Persons Responsible for Serious Violations of International Law Committed in the Territory of the Former Yugoslavia since 1991. As recently as the 24th of March this year, in proceedings in that court involving two defendants, Stanisic and Simatovic, the court ruled in favour of the addition of more victims to its procedures, more material and documentation relating to them. The International Criminal Court, of which we have heard this morning, and here I have to fiddle a bit with my papers, um, has issued, and you can find it on the internet, a booklet, Victims Before the International Criminal Court, a guide for the participation of victims in the proceedings of the court. And, as Dr. Doak anticipated, or as I understood him, that document contains certain components that raise eyebrows amongst traditional common law trained lawyers, of which I make it quite clear I offer myself as a quintessential example. Additionally, the International Criminal Court has a Victims' Trust Fund. And I'd just like to read from its press release of the 6th of May, 2011. On May the 6th, 2011, the Trust Fund for Victims, TV, TFV, at the International Criminal Court invites expressions of interest to support the rehabilitation of victim survivors of sexual and gender-based violence in the Central African Republic because it has identified a pressing priority need for assistance to victim survivors in such crimes in the context of the situation in the Central African Republic. However, future Trust Fund for Victims programs in the Central African Republic may also address victims of other types of crime. The Trust Fund for Victims projects that provide physical and psychological rehabilitation and material support to victims of crimes under the jurisdiction of the ICC. I have referred, referred to this international material to establish the second bookend. In other words, I have moved from the pensioner of a certain age walking along Glenmore Road, Paddington, to the horrors of Yugoslavia, the Central African Republic, and now in recent weeks and indeed recent days, Libya and Rwanda. And on reflection, my bookends turn out to be, I suppose, a continuum. But I have established it to provide a context for myself and such connection as I have with victimhood in New South Wales. I now go to my guiding concepts and principles. The rule of law is sacred to the coherence and civilised standards of society. It should never be permitted to be corroded or corrupted by vigilantism, vengeance, unreasoning, prejudice and intolerance. <coughs> 